to the latest edition of Breaking Down Bergman. I'm David Friend. I'm Sonia Sturmban. And today we're looking at a ship to India. Where the passion? Da kan det vara här styrman vill ha en enkel man som jag som inte längre har något att säga till dem på mitt eget parti. Och då sjunker ni nästan till botten igen nu. Det är tredje gången det händer nu. Det var tråkigt. Ja men förstår du inte att du måste... Du ska inte skrika så vi har främmande ombord. Va? Jag sa att herrarna ska vara vänliga och uppföra sig belevat och anständigt då vi har främmande ombord. Så vi. Det här är min grabb det. Min stora grabb. Styrman på skutan och allting. Nu ska han inte hälsa på damen. Damen heter Sally. Nå ska du inte hälsa på damen. God dag. <laughs> Engrossing film, would you say? Not exactly. In fact, I think, I mean, we haven't seen very many yet, but I can definitely put this one at the bottom of my list. But, um, I don't know, it just wasn't, it didn't grab me from the start, and it didn't bring anything really to the picture throughout. Um, I think it was, I think what, the way that I can put it most uh, succinctly was it was a challenging film to watch. I mean, there, it wasn't that it was too simplistic, or it was stupid, or it was poorly structured, mm -hmm. though maybe the latter is somewhat true. It was just there was a lot there, and it didn't really deliver in a way that captivated me. It was a very um, noticeable attempt at complexity. It felt almost like a chore. That might be a bit of a cliche, but this chore of a film was also at the Cannes Film Festival, which some people seem to think is the home of chore type films. Um, but uh, it was the first Bergman film to play there, and I think that's significant in itself because uh, this is the director who went on to build his name, but the screening of it was quite disastrous. They put the reels in the wrong order, um, and I guess yeah. he had a bit of a freak out um, behind the scenes there, and yeah. people weren't particularly pleased. But um, we want to talk about the characters because I think that's sort of where this film excels, would you say? Yeah, I think the characterizations are very interesting. I mean, I'm not really going to go into a plot summary on this one because there are so many like plot mini peaks that to go through all them, it would be just a 20 minute plot summary, which would be mm -hmm. not fun for anyone. But the, the key thing to notice is we have a family dynamic. So there's a mother, father and a son. And, uh, and then the father has a mistress who then the son takes up with and the father tries to kill himself. and. There's a lot of complexity in terms of, uh, I really think it's his first, well, of the three that we've seen so far, it's the first clear commitment to a psychological drama. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, what the, the areas that I liked in the film were the way that the psychologies play out between the characters and the relationships that they either build or destroy amongst themselves, and also the way that the settings are very much symbolic of the interior states of the character's mind. Mm -hmm. Here we have three sets, mm -hmm. um, the first being the ship. That which the is, family lives on. Right, it's quite claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. There's also the windmill where, um, and uh, the cabaret. Now, they're all relatively claustrophobic mm -hmm. settings and you, you sort of thought that, that there, was a, there was a reason for that. Yeah, because they all, um, to me, they all symbolize some kind of trap that each of these characters is, you know, stuck in and they can't really get out. And for each character, there's, I think the motivation is to be liberated. The son, he wants to be liberated from the tyranny of his father, who really is a, a bastard. Um, and the father wants, he has these delusions of grandeur. He just wants to be adored and recognized all the time, but in reality, he's a failure. He, he pretends to be this uh, grand explorer who's gone to all these exotic lands and survived, you know, fevers and like met native indigenous peoples and he pretends all of these things about himself and and so he's stuck um, in this in this fake life always trying to uphold it and he can't get out and so they're all kind of embroiled in this depressing stew. <laughs> and one of the things we were talking about was the ship right because ultimately that is what is the centerpiece of the symbolism in this movie right? Well it's interesting because what do ships typically symbolize, right? Um, normally, when you think of literature or film, it's it's an escape. People always escape on a ship. They go to new and exotic places on a ship, right? It's, it's a way to free oneself. Whereas here, here it's, the opposite. it's the complete opposite. The father is stuck. His, his only real project now, he can't sail, he's also going blind in the film. And his last project is given to him because there's this old, rotted out ship, which he's trying to refurbish and make... Um, seaworthy again. And so, you know, his whole failed life is symbolized in this rotting ship, which he just can't resurrect. And he, I think he comes to the realization that 
this ship embodies him and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so he's trapped by this ship. Do you think this is too heavy handed though? I mean, we, we, touched, we talked about this before, it's but is, heavy. It, it's is, definitely it, too, is heavy. it too much? Is, is, I, I kind of feel, at least myself, that this is a little bit of a sign that Bergman isn't fully developed as a director. He knows what he's doing in terms of the symbolism, you know but he's doing too much of it. I agree. It's, it's not, there's no subtlety. Yeah. There's no subtlety and there's no mystery. It's like beating the viewer over the head with like how devastating these people are, how trapped they are because of, you know, society has put them in this position and they can't get out and yeah, it's 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 definitely like for me it was it it was a chore. I can't think of a better word. There were some good parts in the movie though. The one that really sticks in my mind is when uh, the father and son are, are doing this the diving mm -hmm. exercise and the father um, decides to stop feeding air to his son. Obviously more symbolism. Um, but the way that it played out with the use of just sound um, and shadow. I thought that was a, a real progression for Bergman um, because it created this sort of intensity that we haven't seen in his films before. And uh, as a viewer, uh, it, it, it was riveting at the time. see the father when he actually committed the action. We only yeah. saw the shadow of it. Yeah. So that was an interesting choice. And I don't know whether that was him as a director kind of almost feeling sorry for the character and kind of, you know, not incriminating him in a way, like protecting him sort of yeah. by not showing the act. I'm not really sure. I think Bergman felt very attached to this film. Do you think this is one that's essential? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think if you do some reading on it maybe and maybe watch some clips um, and basically just know the fact that it was his you know first attempt at a very uh, symbolism heavy psychological drama mm -hmm. then you'll kind of get and where he's exploring the interiority of relationships I think that's really the takeaway here uh, that brings us to the end of this edition of Breaking Down Bergman our next film is Music and Darkness which actually sounds pretty interesting yeah totally uplifting <laughs> for a okay. change um, and uh, thanks guys for breaking down Burden with us. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. And uh, we would appreciate your feedback, so feel free to comment. And together we will continue to break down Burden. See you next time.